Obviously, it starts with the fact that uh, Leon Trotsky is an absolute giant of 20th century socialism. It, in fact, I don't think, with the, with the solitary exception of Lenin, I don't think there's any other figure um, who made a comparable contribution to uh, the practice or the theory uh, of Marxism or the struggle for socialism uh, uh, as, as did Trotsky. I mean, you just go through, start with just the main facts of his biography, and I'm not going to concentrate on that at all. I'm going to concentrate on his ideas, because that's what counts today. But if you just run through the main facts of his biography, they're extraordinary. Um, at, uh, in 1905, at the age of 26, he be became president of the Petrograd Soviet. In other words, effectively, uh, the principal public leader of the 1905 revolution. Uh, after that, he was arrested. He went off to prison in Siberia. He escaped. In the meantime, writing the best <coughs> analysis of the time of the dynamics of the Russian Revolution that I'll come to, um, he, he uh, returns after opposing the First World War and being in exile and so on. He returns to Russia in 1917. Uh, he immediately becomes a leading figure in the 1917 revolution. Then. Uh, is again elected the president of the uh, Petrograd Soviet in that capacity and as chair of the Military Revolutionary Committee uh, is the principal organizer of uh, uh, the greatest revolution in world history, the October uh, uh, Revolution. He then goes on to lead the defense of that revolution as the leader and creator of the Red Army. Then uh, he uh, is the leader of the left opposition to the rise of Stalinism. In some ways, his most, I think his most important historical uh, achievement. He then uh, goes on to found the, the Fourth International uh, in, in 1938. That's just the main facts. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about this with, with Trotsky is that uh, um, what would be major achievements for almost any other figure, you know, and you say they will, you know, we'll remember them forever as the person who, who did this. Then when you look at Trotsky life, they're really minor achievements. You know, the fact that after six years of revolutionary struggle, the most intense uh, struggle imaginable, he has a break and writes a book on literature and revolution that turns out to be it, it, one of the finest works on the question of, uh, of um, uh, uh, literature in the Marxist canon. Uh, and, uh, uh, you, know, is, it, you know, one of his very minor achievements. Uh, the fact that he was the principal defender in uh, absentia in the Moscow trials barely meant, you know, I mean, can you imagine that uh, situation where the, the most incredible international slander campaign is being mounted against Trotsky, being called a fascist agent and so on, people are being shot, he's the principal defender. It's an afterthought in, uh, in when, you, when you come to looking at, uh, at his achievements. So you're, we're confronted with that all the time. This presents... Uh, this fact, this, this extraordinary range of achievements on, on his part, that's a real problem for anybody in my position trying to do a meeting. I've got 35 minutes. I've got to speak about Trotsky and Trotskyism today. Uh, so, I, apologize. so what I'm going to do is I, I, I would identify five main pillars, if you like, of, uh, of, of, of Trotskyism, five main pillars of Trotsky's thought. It would be much easier if there were only two or three. <laughs> but there are five. Each one of them merits a meeting on its own. I can only give, say, a few words uh, about them. Which, Anyway, there we are. Um, the first uh, of the, the, these five pillars is the theory of uh, permanent revolution. I already alluded to this. This was uh, first developed by Trotsky out of the experience of the 1905 revolution. What did it signify? It meant it was in opposition to, it was developed in opposition to what was the prevailing orthodoxy among Russian Marxists at the time. The orthodoxy that was represented by the Mensheviks and by Plakhanov, the father of the um, uh, of Russian Marxism, the founder of Russian Marxism, which said uh, that the, what was coming in Russia would be a bourgeois democratic revolution and that the job of uh, Marxists and of the working class movement was to support 
the bourgeois revolution as a first stage. Only after the bourgeois revolution had uh, been successfully uh, accomplished, the kind of Russian equivalent of 1789 in France, only after that would the struggle uh, for socialism, the independent struggle of the working class, really begin. Uh, uh, this position was partially shared even by Lenin. Lenin had a much more radical version of it because he argued that the workers should leave the bourgeois revolution. So the, the, the dominant Menshevik position were, was one where, where the workers should play a subordinate role, but just a supporting role in this. Lenin wanted the, uh, the working class to play the leading role in it, but still thought you couldn't go beyond uh, a bourgeois democratic revolution because of the um, economic and political backwardness of, of Russia. Trotsky contested this. He didn't contest that Russia was heading for a democratic revolution. Uh, he agreed with that. He agreed with the idea that uh, the working class should lead, take the leading role in this. But he argued that if the working class took a leading role in this, the logic of the struggle would mean that the working class would have to make inroads into capitalism, that it would have to establish its own power. It would become a permanent revolution in the sense of it would move directly through from a democratic revolution against Tsarism into uh, uh, the establishment of workers' power of the socialist revolution, which then, he argued, could only be completed internationally, um, uh, 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 and so on. And I got all sorts of quotes, and I'm worried about time from the beginning, but I will read this one because I think it sums it up. It's, 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 um, uh, the permanent revolution in an exact translation, is the continuous revolution, the uninterrupted revolution. What is the political idea embodied in this? Uh, it is for us that the revolution does not come to an end after this or that political conquest, after obtaining this or that social reform, but that it continues to develop further and its only boundary is the socialist uh, uh, society. Thus, once begun, the revolution is in no case interrupted by us at any formal stage, whatever. On the contrary, we continually and constantly advance it in conformity, of course, with the situation. Uh, right. This applies to the conquest of the revolution inside of a country as well as to extension over the international uh, arena. Right. Um, now, this was of huge significance, obviously, for the Russian Revolution itself. It was vindicated in, uh, in 1917, where the overthrow of Tsarism in February grew over seamlessly uh, into uh, the October insurrection, right? So it, it, it proved itself in Russia, but it also became increasingly important on an international scale. Uh, and I haven't got time to talk uh, uh, about all the aspects of that, but it changes Marxism from Marxism in the days of the Second International, of German social democracy, of Karl Kautz's Marxism in 1914, was essentially a movement and a program of a minority of the world's population, of Europe and North America, where capitalism already existed. In relation to the vast majority of the planet, Marxism was something for the future, later, not immediate. The program of socialist revolution was not an immediate reality. The theory of permanent revolution applied, as Trotsky did, then particularly in relation to the Chinese revolution, uh, uh, and then applied, generalized internationally, means that we now have a perspective of global socialist uh, uh, revolution. So it was a, a hu hugely uh, important. Second uh, main uh, pillar uh, of um, uh, of Trotskyism uh, is his analysis of the degeneration uh, of the Russian Revolution. I think for um, socialists uh, of my generation, uh, you know, of the late 60s and so on and before that, this was probably, you know, this question was so fundamental uh, to us. And it's faded a bit because, you know, the collapse of communism and the passing of time and so on. But it remains the case that if you are a serious Marxist, you have to deal with the fact that the greatest socialist revolution ended in Stalinist tyranny. You have to deal with the arguments of why was that the case? Was that human nature? Was that because of some inherent totalitarian tendency in Marxism or in Leninism and so on? 
Uh, does it mean that revolutions will always fail? Etc. All those questions haven't gone away. They're still there. And the phenomenon of Stalinism, enormously weaker than it was, it still exists in the world and its legacy is there. And its legacy is still there on much of, on much of the left, uh, uh, unfortunately. So this question is still uh, a question that we, that we need an answer for. And for um, uh, and obviously, in the time of, of Trotsky's life, and in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, the time of uh, Tony Clare, for, uh, when he developed the theory of state capitalism, and so this was a, this was a question of life and death for, uh, for socialists. And here, uh, Trotsky played uh, an immense role in the sense that he identified, at the time, the fact that the revolution was undergoing a uh, bureaucratic degeneration, and that ultimately Stalinism was a counter-revolutionary force, uh, and he, he, he understood the roots of this uh, correctly in, uh, as lying in the fact, first of all, in the extreme economic backwardness of Russia, and that the weakness of the Russian uh, working class. Uh, Russia, remember, although Trotsky had uh, understood that that working class could take power, even though it was a minority, even though it was primarily a peasant country and so on, it was nonetheless possible for it to lead the peasants in taking power. This created a problem afterwards in the sense that the, that the working class was a minority of the society and that working class was extremely um, uh, devastated, ravaged by the civil war uh, that followed the revolution and so on. So uh, the Economic weakness of the country was one fundamental factor that uh, leading to the bureaucratization of the revolution. And this was interacting with the other thing that was even more central, which was that the revolution remained isolated. Trotsky had always argued as a central part of the theory of permanent revolution that uh, uh, the Russian revolution would have to spread uh, to survive, but you couldn't build socialism uh, in one country in Russia that international revolution was the prerequisite for even the maintenance of workers' power in Russia, uh, and that therefore, because the international revolution nearly succeeded, did not, revolution didn't actually succeed in spreading to Germany, to Italy, uh, to France, etc., etc., um, therefore a process of degeneration uh, 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 set in. So in other words, the degeneration of the Russian revolution was not the result of human nature was not because of inherent totalitarian tendencies in Marx or in Lenin, but was a product of the um, defeat of the international class struggle and the objective uh, conditions that uh, uh, that revolution uh, found itself in. But the consequence of that was that Stalinism built a, uh, a, a bureaucratic counter revolutionary force. So that's the, 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 the honor both within Russia and uh, <coughs> internationally. So that's the, the, the second uh, pillar. The th and that leads directly on to the third uh, outstanding feature of uh, Trotsky's Marxism, that is his internationalism. Now, of course, Marxism has always been internationalist. You know, not for nothing did the Communist Manifesto close with the slogan, workers of all countries unite. Uh, Marx and Engels themselves understood that you couldn't create socialism in one country uh, uh, as uh, early as uh, uh, 1845 or 1847, they were already saying this. But you know, an idea can exist uh, and just to kind of take it for granted, it's when the idea is challenged, it's when there's a real debate about it that it really, that you, re you, you really, um, it, it's really put to the test and the question is who def defends it. You know, the, the question of the state. Marx understood, uh, on the basis of the experience of the Paris Commune, that <coughs> the working class could not take over the existing state apparatus uh, and use it for its purpose. It would be necessary to smash the state, and he amended the Communist Manifesto to this effect. But it was really when that idea was abandoned by social democracy, and Lenin had to come forward uh, and defend Marx's original idea in State and Revolution, that that, that theory uh, really gets clarified. That's why we talk about the Leninist theory of the state, and we identify that idea. As Marx had it first, but we identify it with Lenin because of the State and Revolution. And with internationalism, I think it's the same with Trotsky, because it was the challenge to that represented by the theory of socialism in one country, 
<laughs> Stalin developed in 1924 and onwards, supported by Bukharin and others. Uh, and so that really challenged the fundamental internationalism of Marxism. And Trotsky came forward as the defender of, uh, of international revolution against uh, socialism in one country. Trotsky's internationalism went very, uh, very deep. Um, he, he, um, he describes, um, sorry, um, he speaks about Lenin here, but I think he could be speaking about himself. Lenin's internationalism is a guide to revolutionary action embracing all nations. Our planet is considered as one single battlefield where various nations and social classes contend. So his internationalism meant that he always started from a broad international point, uh, point of view. Uh, of course, it involved solidarity, being anti-racist and so on, but it was this broad international point of view that characterizes Trotsky to, uh, throughout his life. And therefore, he wrote uh, uh, you know, not only about the Russian Revolution, but also about the Chinese Revolution, uh, about Britain. He writes a brilliant book about Britain at the time of the general strike, uh, and so where is Britain going? He, he, he writes about the Spanish Revolution. Uh, uh, he writes about Story. I'll come on to this about Germany and so on. So he's always looking at the, uh, 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 at the world as a whole and developing international uh, perspectives. So Trotsky's internationalism, I think, is the, the third uh, uh, <coughs> uh, important pillar. Um, that leads uh, directly on to uh, saying that in the struggle against Stalinism, Trotsky not only combated what Stalin was doing in Russia, but he also saw that Stalinism, through socialism in one country, would destroy the international communist movement, would transform it from a movement serving uh, world revolution and serving the revolution in each country that it existed into instruments of Soviet foreign policy. If, as he put it, socialism was, it was possible to build socialism in Russia alone, in other words, if the main historical task could be achieved in Russia, then what that meant was that the communist parties in other parts of the world, their main job was to, to shore up Russia, was to serve as instruments of pressure on their own uh, ruling classes, or instruments for forging allies with nationalist movements or others that could become allies of the Soviet Union and instruments of Soviet foreign policy. He also saw that if you could build socialism in one country in Russia, the same idea could be applied in France or in England. And you know, soon this happened mainly after Trotsky's death, but he was absolutely right on this because you then suddenly found that you would get the British Communist Party talking, producing a pamphlet, the British road to socialism and somebody else would have the Irish road to socialism or the somebody else's road to socialism. They all turned out to be the same road, by the way. They were all parliamentary reformist roads, but they were presented as national roads uh, to socialism. In other words, what Trotsky saw was that um, the, the, uh, the socialism of one country would uh, turn the international communist movement into uh, uh, into a force, into essentially uh, a counter-revolutionary force and a reformist force and, 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 uh, uh, and so on. And um, uh, this then led to one of uh, Trotsky's uh, greatest achievements, which was his analysis of fascism uh, and how to fight it. Uh, all right. And it's, uh, again, it's an extraordinary achievement in itself. Here is Trotsky has just been exiled from the Soviet Union. He's uh, ensconced on the in Principo, the Prince's Islands off the coast of, of Turkey. Right. Meanwhile, Hitler uh, and the Nazis are in the process of building mass support in Germany and on the edge of taking power. Now, uh, that in those circumstances, Trotsky was able to produce what well, is still the greatest analysis of fascism and still the fundamental guide to how to fight it is in itself a, a, an astonishing achievement. Um, you know, he managed to do it at the same time as writing the history of the Russian Revolution, uh, at the same time as writing, more or less, as writing my life. You know, each of, any of which would be a lifetime achievement for anybody else he manages to do this. But uh, 
tremendous importance because the, the truth is that the, uh, before Hitler, the, there was a dreadful tendency on the left internationally to actually underestimate the danger of fascism. And uh, in specifically in relation to the international communist movement, uh, it was subject on the orders of Stalin to a monstrous uh, sectarian ultra-leftism whereby the main enemy was seen as not being the Nazis, but uh, being the Social Democrats. Now, of course, the Social Democrats were terrible, uh, they terrible traitors to the German working class and were responsible politically for the murder of Rosa Luxemburg and so on. But nonetheless, this, uh, this sectarianism divided the German working class at precisely the point in time where, as a matter of life or death, they needed unity. Uh, 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 against, uh, against the Nazis. And um, it was uh, Trotsky's uh, analyses that showed, first of all, that the terrible danger that the fascists represented. They will ride over the spine uh, of, the, of the German working class like a terrible tank, was how uh, he put it there very, very uh, vividly. Trotsky understood that a victory for the Nazis would be a world historic defeat for the working class. It would destroy all uh, elements of working class democracy that had been an organ organization that had been built up and so on. Uh, and at the same time, he mapped out in uh, uh, great detail how it was necessary, without making any concessions to reformism, without any compromise with the political program of social democracy uh, uh, at all, but it was necessary to fight for a united front uh, uh, against, uh, uh, against the Nazis. He then developed this analysis further uh, into a critique of popular frontism. After Hitler came to power, right, uh, the uh, again, uh, uh, on orders from Stalin and Moscow, the international communist movement changed its position. Having uh, uh, really downplayed the threat of, uh, of Hitler, uh, they then, Stalin suddenly saw that uh, a Nazi Germany was a military threat to the Soviet Union. Then they switched to the idea that you should have an alliance uh, with all anti-fascist forces, including the so-called democracies of Britain and France and so on, including democratic Tories and uh, progressive bourgeois and so on in a popular front. And again, Trotsky developed his theory of the United Front in opposition to this and argued that if the working class is led into an alliance with the, the so-called democratic sections of the bourgeoisie, the effect of this actually is to paralyze its own struggle. You can only make an alliance with uh, the, the uh, bourgeoisie uh, or, or its progressive sections on condition that the working class holds back their own struggle because the antagonism, the class antagonism between the bourgeoisie and the working class it, it is so great they will not possibly make a, an alliance unless, uh, unless the workers agree to, to, to hold back. In other words, the effect of this, it adds to the size of the movement uh, numerically, but paralyzes its ability to struggle. And this was proven absolutely correct, in tragi tragically correct in circumstances in the Spanish Revolution, where a magnificent working class response to Franco and fascism in Spain was systematically demobilized <coughs> in the name of the popular, uh, 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 of the popular front. Uh, 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 in such a way that both the Spanish Revolution was <coughs> and the ability to um, mobilise the energy of the working class and to appeal to the peasants behind uh, Franco's lines and so on was lost and, and, and military victory to, to Franco was conceded. <coughs> Finally, uh, the, the last pillar of Trotsky's thought that I want to emphasise <laughs> is uh, Trotsky's Leninism. Now, in uh, between 1903 and 1917, uh, Trotsky was not a member of the Bolshevik Party or the Bolshevik faction originally of the uh, Russian Soviet Democratic <coughs> Labour Party or the Bolshevik Party. He was an independent. It's not true that he was a Menshevik uh, because he was separated from the Mensheviks by his support for permanent revolution, uh, which they rejected, but he was not a, a, a Bolshevik. But he understood from experience in 1917 that he was mistaken in this. And he learned in 
1917, the absolute necessity of an independent revolutionary party. And he learned that lesson well, and he stuck to, uh, stuck to it. Uh, he regarded that lesson as being confirmed by the whole uh, experience of the revolutions that swept Europe uh, uh, after the, at the end of the First World War. And the fact that only in Russia was there success, and in elsewhere the, uh, the uh, revolutions failed. Even though they came very close, even though you had the two red years in even though you had the two yet red years in Italy, even though uh, you had uh, five years of revolutionary struggle in Germany, even though you had the most immense economic crisis in 1923, and so on. I've ten minutes, I haven't got time to go through all the details, but Trotsky regarded the fact that the revolution had not broken through internationally as fundamentally because there wasn't a, a, a revolutionary party. And, um, um, I will uh, just uh, uh, sum up what he says uh, on this quote, <coughs> quote, quote, very striking. Uh, if the triumphant revolution, this is from Lessons of October that he wrote in 1924, if the triumphant revolution did not come at the end of the war, it was because a party was lacking. Without a party, apart from a party, over the head of a party, or with a substitute for a party, the proletarian revolution cannot come. We have paid far too dearly for this conclusion with regard to the role and importance of a party in a proletarian revolution. To renounce it slightly, or even to minimise uh, its significance. Right. Um, and, you know, you can sometimes can argue about quotes. Well, Trotsky said that then, and he said something else at a different time. But the point was, not only did Trotsky say it, pretty unequivocal, he spent the remaining 17 years of his life putting that into practice. And I have all sorts of problems in doing that, and I'll say something about this uh, uh, in, in, in a moment. But the, the idea of the absolute necessity of... Um, building a party, building an independent revolutionary party of the working class, that remains central for, for Trotsky. Now, I got running in already into the problem that uh, I knew I would run into from the beginning of how to fit all this in. Um, I just, the question, this meeting is not only about Trotsky, but also about Trotskyism today. And I want to just simply say that if you take those five pillars, do they stand? Are they still relevant? Um, I want to argue that they are all more relevant than ever. They all absolutely stand. On the question of permanent revolution, there's been some uh, argument about whether it still applies. Uh, sometimes they say, well, permanent revolution was about how you make the transition from uh, feudal Russia to, uh, to socialist revolution. And since feudalism doesn't exist in the world anymore, permanent revolution is no longer relevant. I don't agree with that. I think you've just got to glance at some of the major areas of conflict in the world today uh, and the uh, arguments that socialists have to put forward to see that permanent revolution remains uh, a crucial idea for us. Let's start with uh, um, the, the question of the Middle East to, today. You, whether you look at the Egyptian revolution or the situation of the Palestinians, either of those two key uh, questions. In the Egyptian revolution, were we four enthusiastic participants in the democratic struggle to overthrow Mubarak? Absolutely. Of course. Of, of, of course. Do we put forward democratic demands? Absolutely. But do we see that as going through one fixed stage? First we overthrow Mubarak and then later you begin the struggle of the working class? Absolutely not. We fight for the leading role of the working class. It was, of course, workers struggle that played a leading role in overthrowing Mubarak, and then do you carry that struggle forward into a struggle for socialism so that you hope, it didn't happen, but you hope that the uh, Egyptian revolution will grow over it into workers' power? Do you fight for that? Of course you do. What do we say about uh, Palestine? Are we unconditionally on the side of the Palestinians against Zionism? Of course we are, but how can the Palestinians win? Right? How, can, how can they achieve 
uh, a secular democratic state from the river to the sea and so on, only through the struggle of the Arab working class of the, of the Middle East and so on. That's the only force that can actually defeat Zionism. So the, so the argument of permanent revolution applies absolutely to Egypt and to the Middle East uh, today. Then, uh, look, uh, other side of the world, look at South Africa, rightly featuring strongly in this year, there's Marxism and so on. When you talk about Marikana, what do you see? You see where you, what you get if you go for a stages theory as opposed to the, the logic of permanent revolution. That is what Marikana uh, represents uh, in, in South Africa. You, uh, you know, the ANC in the Stalinist tradition held the stages theory. First you overthrow apartheid, then you go through a period of transition, and only later will you begin the struggle for the working class and so on. And Marikan uh, uh, is what you get. So the question, the theory of permanent revolution, I can give many other examples, extre extremely relevant. I've already said that the analysis of the uh, of Stalinism um, uh, and the degeneration of the Russian Revolution features less strongly now, perhaps, the, than it did. Uh, uh, in past generations, but still uh, is fundamental uh, to, to being a, a, a serious Marxist analysis of the world. Um, internationalism, more relevant than ever in glo global capitalism. Uh, not only is it the case that the system is more internationally integrated, uh, and that we need to, to look at how that, and analyze how that works in the world, it's also clear, just look at what happened uh, with the Arab Spring, that the potential for spreading revolution internationally uh, is greater than it ever was. The working class now being uh, such an enormously more powerful force uh, all from South America to China than it was in Tropical Day, that the potential for international revolution uh, uh, is, is remarkable. Then uh, um, the analysis of fascism and the United Front and how to fight it, again, could not be more relevant. Um, we see uh, uh, right across Europe the rise of racist and fascist organisations. We see the terrible price paid, for example, in France, where a substantial united front was not established uh, to, to confront the Front National uh, when it should have been, uh, would have prevented it becoming, or could have prevented it becoming a mass force, as fortunately we were able to do in Britain with the uh, with the National Front and the BNP in Britain and so on. So that, uh, 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 again, could not be uh, more, more relevant. The question of Leninism, there's been much debate about it. Obviously there's no time in a meeting like this to go into the details. But the main, what always worries me in this is that in arguments about what exactly should be the organisation of the Leninist party, what form it should take and what uh, should be the you know, organisational procedures, but so often I see that what gets lost in this is precisely the baby with the bathwater. What you end up with is an abandonment of the project of building an independent revolutionary party, which was the, the, uh, a, a part, an independent party uh, 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 of the working class, which was so central to the success of the Russian Revolution and central to the life. Now, is there any reason to suppose when we look at the world today that this is no longer needed. All the factors uh, that made that necessary in 1917 and made it necessary in 1920 or 23 uh, and so on remain in play in the world today. Is it true that if you just have broad movements and you just have uh, um, uh, you, you know, popular assemblies and so on, that reformism will go away? and will, uh, will be overcome. Not at all. Reformism can perfectly well live with that <coughs> co-opt them and corrupt such movements and certainly will be uh, betrayed. So the question of building a revolutionary party in order to fight for revolutionary leadership of the working class remains central. Is it the case... Yes, I did. I did. This, this was going to happen. I couldn't find a way out of it. Sum up, I'm told. But, uh, so, uh, and I haven't got to. I, I, I'm going to have to go over time. I'm sorry. Um, because, uh, I've got no choice. I've got no choice because I can't stop uh, at, that, at this point. I want to say that all the main pillars of Trotsky are, uh, uh, it seems to me, are absolutely relevant today. But 
And that's when we talk uh, uh, about um, uh, Trotskyism today, uh, there's a contrast, which you can't avoid feeling. With, uh, uh, and that contrast is between the greatness of Trotskyism uh, and the rather pathetic character of so many of the movements, parties, sects that call themselves Trotskyists. And you have to say, that's why I said I can't stop, despite the orders from the chair, I have to say something about that, say for the balance of the meeting. And I, I just want to say this, uh, um, you know, we can investigate much further, perhaps it'll be what people talk about, and they can come back on the summing up. But I want to say that I think there are three main causes for that. For that. Uh, the first two were political and were part of the... Uh, legacy of Trotsky himself. Uh, this was an incorrect uh, definition or analysis of the Soviet Union as still a work of state because of its uh, nationalisation uh, and secondly the economic perspectives on which the um, Fourth International were founded. Uh, on the first question uh, I think that the attempt to the belief that the Soviet Union represented a fundamentally non-capitalist economy, that it was in somehow or other embodied uh, 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 working class interests, even though Stalinism was bad, uh, etc., was A, wrong and B, <coughs> disastrous for the movement. It was disastrous for Trotskyism itself because if you thought that the Soviet Union and then Eastern Europe and China and all these countries were, had, had workers' revolutions, then what you really were saying was that Stalinism is the main revolutionary force in the world. Trotskyists would do it nicer, but you know, really they're where, it, where it's at. So it was self-defeating for the Trotskyist movement, and it, or, it, it also fundamentally under, misunderstood the nature of, uh, uh, of capitalism. Which, and of state capitalism, because of a strong state capitalist element in Western capitalism uh, uh, as well. And it led to innumerable splits uh, and problems for the, for the Trotskyist movement trying to square those circles. Secondly, there's no getting away from the fact that when Trotsky founded the Fourth International, that it was founded on the perspective that further economic development under capitalism, further economic growth uh, was impossible, that the system was in its death agony. That was the title of the manifesto, the death agony of capitalism. And Trotsky explicitly says in it, I've got the quotations here, that, that uh, there can be no talk of further reforms, there can be no talk of further economic development. And this was not true. And the problem was that many of the Trotskyists <coughs> were confronted with realities, both in Eastern Europe and China and so on, where you'd had uh, this transition to uh, uh, state ownership without workers' revolutions and confronted with the realities of economic boom uh, in the West are on an unprecedented scale, clung to the doctrine rather than look at reality. And the third thing, and I will finish with this, so uh, thank you for the uh, I will finish with this. Uh, 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 and in a way, I would like to develop this much more, but I can't. Uh, the third thing was that for what was originally for entirely objective reasons, the Trotskyist movement was uh, cut off from the mass of the working class. I say objective reasons, this happens because of the defeat of the international revolution, because of the rise of Stalinism in Russia. The result is that Trotsky, the Trotskyist movement that Trotsky was able to build, despite his best efforts, was a tiny movement without roots in the, in the working class. And this objective problem then becomes a subjective problem as well because Trotskyism has been rivaled, riven by and dominated by sectarianism and many of the movements that call themselves Trotskyists and that you can encounter you know on a demonstration or whatever with their, uh, their newspaper are clearly, no it's not just that they're small, their whole attitude towards the class and the world is a sectarian attitude and this is this is a legacy that we still have to struggle uh, to, 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 uh, to overcome. Uh, because it, it is only in living interaction with the real working class movement that you can either develop Marxist theory or change the world. So that's a, that's a historic problem, but it doesn't change the fact that the, the great pillars of Trots Trotsky are vital to doing that. Trotsky was not a sectarian. 
The great pillars of Trotskyism that I tried to talk about are vital to doing that and absolutely vital to the struggle to change the world today. My name's Rod. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, two questions, actually. Um, and you touched on it when you, you, when you were just finishing. The last question was about factionalism. And uh, as I understand it, there's a hundred plus Trotskyist organisations. There's a whole stack of fourth internationals. There's now two fifth internationals. Um, and that needs some sort of explanation. Um, because it's my opinion that the secret services of the capitalist countries uh, thrive on, on splitting the left. <clears throat> the second question, as you're from Ireland, um, I look back to the 60s, I've been active since that time, and I'm thinking it was a mistake of revolutionary people, revolutionary-minded people, not to support the uh, nationalist struggle against the British Army in Northern Ireland. That's, of course, finished now, so it's not so controversial. But looking back, uh, I think that was a major mistake because I think that could have altered um, what's happening in Britain enormously and, of course, in Ireland. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give an example from the, the fight against fascism uh, in France today. Uh, well, we've had tremendous problems, well everybody's had tremendous problems, trying to defend this idea of a united front. And the fact that people came from Trotskyist organisations didn't necessarily mean that they were going to defend the united front. We have Trotskyist organisations who consider that reformism doesn't exist anymore, uh, and therefore you can't have uh, real reformism, not exactly, and therefore you obviously can't have a united front in that case. Uh, and also, very frequently, there's, there's been, even in my organisation, which is Ensemble, you get pressures to say, oh, well, we must make sure that the anti-fascist campaign denounces everything that the socialist government does, which is, um, which is racist in one way or another. Uh, that is to say that although uh, they say we're very broad and even people from the Socialist Party can come, in reality, no person from the Socialist Party could possibly feel at home in the campaign, in certain of the campaigns, because every meeting they get to, they'd be uh, immediately asked to justify their party on a whole range of other issues, immigration, uh, 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 Roma, Roma, etc. So it's been quite hard, even when people have read their Trotsky, uh, and, and in France here we read Trotsky from the beginning to the end, you know, it's the only language I think where we have the complete works of Trotsky all translated. Um, it, it, can, it can be quite difficult to sort of get this, and I, I think things are getting a little bit better now, uh, that well, there's been uh, demonstrations against the National Front in the, in the, last, uh, the last few weeks, but we've been having to fight really hard because there have been very good revolutionaries saying, uh, well, that demonstration was called by a students' union which is very close to the Socialist Party, so you know, maybe we shouldn't be supporting it. And we've really had to sort of come back again and again and again, and it's far from one, but that's just an example I wanted to give. A couple of points. Just, first of all, uh, uh, before I deal with the thing about Ireland, I just wanted to say one point about uh, John's introduction, it was really good. Slightly disagreed on the development of, uh, of, of Trotsky and Trotskyism into the belief that countries like Eastern Europe, uh, China, Chinese Revolution was as a consequence in Trotsky's analysis because Trotsky, while we disagree with it, was quite clear that the Russians could no longer play a revolutionary role. Uh, it was Trotskyism, if you like, that followed it through. Uh, it was other Trotskyism, it wasn't Trotsky in my view, but that's, uh, that's a, kind of, it's a main point in terms of uh, John's overall analysis. But the issue I wanted to deal with was the question of Ireland, because as somebody who came through the struggle, we did support the national struggle in Ireland. The SWP played a role in defending the right of the nationalist population in Ireland to fight for unity and against British imperialism. We were absolutely clear about that. Where we disagreed with them is we are not nationalists, we are socialists. We believed that the best way of doing that was through uniting the Irish working class in a common struggle, not just against British imperialism but against capitalism. You know, and I think we were also right on that, but be, be absolutely clear that the SWP played an important role in fighting against British imperialism in Ireland and supporting the national struggle and arguing for uh, troops out. I did it. I had to fight for it in the unions. I had to argue for it against a whole number uh, of different organisations on the left included. Uh, and we, we stood up and uh, did our bit in fighting for, uh, for, for the, the struggle in Ireland and for the, the, against British imperialism. So I want that cleared up. Thank you.
Yeah, uh, hello, Dean Harris, Walking Forest. I just want to say a little bit about um, Trot, one of Trotsky's five main things, and that was the United Front, and how, how you grow um, and how people around you grow when it gets put in practice. It's Marxism in practice and, and, and Trotskyism in practice. And that was the, uh, the We Are Walking Forest UAF stuff that happened in Walking Forest. And, um, you know, we didn't get 4,000 people on the streets. The, uh, the reason we got 4,000 people on the streets is because we had a Trotskyist analysis, and that is absolutely fundamental. Because time-consuming stuff, the arguments we had with other members of the left, etc., around who was the real enemy, the Labour Party, because they are part of the problem. All that kind of stuff went on and on and on and on. Muslims, they're homophobic, they're misogynist. Actually, I had to point out to several really prominent left-wingers, Muslims are working class too, and have the bloody contradictions like the rest of the working class. And you need to get that into your head. That is, that is Islamophobia. Whose side are you on? The other things I want to just say also is that it's really important to remember, I suppose in a way, is that where you look around the world, where you look around Europe, where the United Front's put in place, if you look at Greece and parts of Spain, it works. So, you know, it's, 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 what, it's, it's what we, what we, we, what we um, fight for. Um, the other thing about the uh, United Front method was it's about being a one-trick pony when it comes to fight fascism. That's what we had to get in people's heads. This is about, if you have to, get in bed with the devil. Because I tell you what, they're waiting in the wings all the time. And you've got to actually get on the streets, forget all your other arguments about what people have got to say. And when it comes to the home, you can have that after. Smash them bastards, keep them off the street. And if it wasn't for United Front, BNP would still have people in, um, going electorally. And we would have the EDL running around smashing up people. It's, got, it's, the, it's the best analysis. And well done, John, for bringing up to you. Um, I'm with the Irish organisation and again I want to come back on the role that, um, that we played in the, uh, in the struggle against the, uh, in the struggle against, you know, the, the, the troubles in the north over the last while. There is, um, Trotsky's formula as I understand it uh, was for unconditional but critical support of, uh, of national liberation movements and that's exactly what, what we gave. Um, and we came under criticism for that uh, from, the, uh, from the nationalists, from the IRA, from Sinn Féin, from the provost, who said, well, if you're so, you know, unconditionally supportive of us, why aren't you taking up guns yourselves? You know, why are we left, uh, you know, to do all the fighting and you lot come in with your theory and your pamphlets? A uh, fat lot of good that is to us. Now, in fact, that business of, and again, Trotsky is our guide, that business of um, unconditional but critical support also, uh, he has a, a, a phrase, I can't remember it exactly, but it's the, to the effect of, it's a, a Trotsky on terrorism, where he says that, uh, that one of the reasons that what, uh, what revolutionaries shouldn't be doing is, uh, or sorry, the, the, the problem with, with, uh, with the sort of the provost approach to that national liberation thing of taking up the gun, being the terrorists, is that they substitute themselves for the class. That the class has to liberate itself. Uh, and that to have an eventual solution to a national liberation struggle, you have to have the class uh, coming in, uh, the winners at the end of it. And you don't do that. By having, uh, by having the group of brave men with the guns getting in there and saying, no, we'll do it for you, and you just wait until we have it all sorted. Now, that's again applying Trotskyism uh, in our situation. That's what we attempted to do and continue to try to do in Ireland now. You know, of course, that the armed struggle is over, that they've made peace that now Martin McGuinness, former Chief of Staff of the IRA, is best pals with the Queen, no less, and I'm not kidding. Um, they, sorry, yeah. Uh, but, but we continue the fight for the struggle against the <coughs> poverty, the inequality, and the rising sectarianism of the North, which because it wasn't sorted, is still left to the class struggle and to the Trotskyists who seek to lead it to sort out. Uh, I just wanted to come in on the question of why um, the Trotskyist movement, if you can be polite enough to call it that, is so, so fragmented. And um, I, I don't believe it's because of, of the state. Um, I think that one, there are a number of different factors. One is, I mean to put it crudely, it's a consequence of failure. In other words, if you're weak and lack real social, social influence, then there's a very strong temptation to turn in and blame each other 
for what's gone wrong uh, may ring a, a little with our own recent, recent experience here in the SWP in Britain. But there's another element that I want to emphasise, which is the failure to continue creatively to develop the Marxist tradition in new circumstances. You know, John brought out very well how good Trotsky was at that, at creatively continuing the, the, the Marxist tradition. The problem for the Trotskyists after the Second World War was there was a new situation. Stalinism hadn't collapsed. It had expanded, for, for example. Capitalism hadn't collapsed. It was growing. You know, what do we do? Trotsky isn't here to explain it. So, but what they did, rather than thinking hard about the nature of the change situation, was to fall back on a set of formulae inherited from Trotsky and turn them into a, into a kind of religion. And one of the strong driving forces in that was, the, was an element of adaption to large social forces. OK, there may be only 10 of us, um, but, you know, the Soviet Union, in a sense, is driving um, you know, in a, in a direction away from capitalism so we can feel bigger and stronger. Those temptations continue to exist. Um, I'm one of the very, you know, going back to the situation in Britain, Britain today and the kind of debates that have been going on the far left, one of the striking elements is the way in which quite a large spectrum of forces on the far left in Britain have ended up ad adapting to the left trade union bureaucracy, including people from our own tradition who've, you know, both been to and often given meetings like the one uh, that that John, John has just 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 given about Trotskyism and all that, all that sort of thing, but end up making the kind of mistakes that are in a sense a, a textbook one ones from just reading books. And what that reflects is a failure to continue um, creatively to apply Marxism in new circumstances without um, abandoning <coughs> fundamental principles. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Dennis from uh, France. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the meeting was about Trotsky and Trotskyism, and I share absolutely what John said about Trotsky, and the question is about Trotskyism. I mean, uh, I'm not sure that it's useful for us uh, to be to label ourselves as Trotskyists. I mean, there's a difference between Trotsky and Trotskyism. The 70 years after it, the tradition, the current uh, that we could characterize as a set of uh, experiences and theoretical developments. And uh, as Alex said, you know, this on these two sides, uh, the. Uh, legitimacy of the of Trotskyism in the 70 years is very weak with a lot, of, a lot of troubles. And I think if you look at when Trotsky became in some way uh, a Trotskyist, it was in a period in the 30s with uh, on one side deep economic and, and political crisis, but as well where there were existing a real working class workers movement with organization and, and leadership and the analysis and what built Trotskyism in some way as an organization was the need and the analysis that the main thing was inside these workers' movements, this real workers' movement to fight. It was a struggle for leadership against Stalinist and reformist leadership. And I think that the Trotskyist movement after the war made of this what was conject conjectural, uh, uh, something of, of this time, uh, and largely tactic, tactical things made th these as principles. And, and the question for us now, and I'm going to finish on it, is that we are on these questions, we are on different situation with maybe the task, not completely of course, the workers' movement is still existing, but the workers' movement is very weak. In some ways we have as well to rebuild the workers' movement. You know, I remember the, the article by uh, Duncan Hallas about party and class, and comparing the, the period uh, uh, during the 30s where they were trained, the workers' movement was a trend, and the question was the leadership, the direction of the trend, and that the trend was in some ways not, not existing anymore, and that we, we have to rebuild the workers' movement and the, and the leadership at the, uh, the same time. And about this, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the question and the, the reference to a Trotskyist tradition movement 
not Trotsky, but Trotsky's tradition is very useful and sometimes can be uh, even at all. Hi, yeah. Um, on the, the question of why the Trotskyist movement split, I think that there is a, a, a further problem with Trotsky, um, which relates, I think, to what might be been one of his greatest mistakes. Trotsky himself said his greatest mistake was not joining the Bolsheviks in 1903. Um, but in fact, there's, there's a reflection of this in the 30s when he was forming the Fourth International. And I think the problem is not, not that he formed the Fourth International or, or an organize, international organization, but the way it happened, which actually uh, involved him actually splitting away people who agreed with him with people, revolutionaries, to the left of Stalin, to the left, critical of Stalinism and breaking with it. Um, I'm thinking primarily of the Poom in Spain, um, who he criticised for joining the bourgeois government. I think he was right on that. I think he was wrong to break with them. As a result of that, he broke with the Snake Fleet movement in, uh, in Holland and a number of other organisations, which meant that the Fourth International, when it was formed, was on a sort of restricted ideological basis. Um, and therefore, in fact, reflected not the experience of the Bolsheviks between 1903 and 1917, but actually reflected the experience of Trotsky and his small group, uh, which, is, which was separate from, from the mainstream of, 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 of Russian social democracy. Um, and that in itself gave, gave the Fourth International um, a heritage of orthodoxy, of splitting, of, 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 of trying to keep the orthodoxy straight. Uh, which ended up, of course, in several different fourth internationals, all kinds of things. Actually, what he should have done, of course, was bring together um, those critical of Stalin, revolutionary socialist critical of Stalin, and actually then argued within that for his own position. This is what democratic centralism is about. It's about people with different ideas arguing, debating, coming to a conclusion, and acting together. Um, and I think the, the, the Trotsky sort of forgot about that. He went back to his, to his position in 1903 and therefore left us with actually a not very good heritage. Thank you. Um, it's interesting. You, you've given a title Trotsky and Trotskyism today. And of course you have to speak about Trotsky, don't you? <laughs> and uh, you, when people to discuss goes, you find out what's really worrying people, which not surprisingly is Trotskyism today. Um, and uh, I didn't have much chance to say, say about it. but. Uh, um, I'll try and say some more about it now. Uh, the first, I just mentioned very quickly the question of, of, of Ireland, which was well responded to by the Irish comrades. I just want to link that to something else we were talking about when I talked about the question of permanent revolution. I said that if you want to see what stages theory leads to, you look at Marikana. I could also have said, look, if you want to see what a stages theory leads to, look at Northern Ireland today and look at uh, Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and the question of the Queen and she being best pals with Ian Paisley. And not just that, which is symbolically for republicanism and so on, an uh, awful thing, but also, from the working class point of view, implementing Tory austerity in the North uh, uh, and so on. And if you want to look what uh, the theory of permanent revolution understood creatively and realistically can lead to um, look at the fact that uh, a Trotskyist, if you like, has just been elected in uh, West Belfast as neither um, a unionist nor a nationalist, but a socialist, Jerry Carroll and so on. We've got an article about it in the Irish Marxist Review, which I always plug on these occasions, but is a real, uh, uh, a real breakthrough. Uh, understanding that you have to fight for a united Ireland and support uh, the uh, struggle against British imperialism, but from a working class point of view and so on, and therefore you're not trapped in, in, in implementing Tory austerity, etc. So that's point worth making. The second thing I'll talk about, the, the question of the United Front and, and particularly the situation in France, I alluded to this, I mean it's a tragedy in France that uh, uh, this has been allowed to, to happen. Uh, and that the balance of forces is now so unfavourable, it didn't need uh, to happen. Um, but I, I just want to say about the way in which the question of the United Front is often understood and misunderstood in a way uh, that I think really gets in the way of, uh, uh, of uh, many people understanding what, what it is involved. 
if you look at this from a doctrinaire or sectarian point of view, you go and read Trotsky, and you see that Trotsky has says the United Front is an alliance between the Mass Communist Party and the Mass uh, Social Democratic Party. Good. Right. So how do you apply that in Britain today? Well, you don't have a Mass Communist Party, and the Social Democratic Party that you have is not the same as the Social Democrats in Germany uh, in the, uh, the 1920s or early 30s and so on. And what if you're trying to develop a united front against the local council, which might be a Labour council implementing cuts, that won't work and so on. So, so, right, we can't do a carbon copy of what Trotsky said the united front is, so you end up with no united front. Or you take the situation in France and so on, and you find it doesn't quite fit the rules, and you get locked into a debate about is this the right way to do it or that. Misses the point. Trotsky saw the United Front as an alliance between the communist, mass communist party and the mass social democrat, because that's what existed. The point of the United Front was to maximize the fighting strength of the working class right, against the enemy. That was the point of the United Front, right? Whether the enemy was the bosses attacking workers' conditions, or the enemy, even more seriously, was the, the, the Nazis. You had to maximise that fighting strength, while at the same time building the, maintaining the independence of the revolutionary organisation, the independence of the revolutionary party. That problem exists for us today in space. That problem we still have to address. We have to address it everywhere in the world. And you find the form of doing that. You don't look up the form in Trotsky and say, oh, well, we can't, we're not doing it quite according to the letter. You find the form that fits, whether it's United Against Fashion or whatever it may be, that enables you to achieve the, uh, that in practice. Very I I important in, I I in terms uh, of method. And that leads then uh, to the, the question that I think was most on people's minds, the, 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 the question about the problem of the fate of the Trotskyist movement and its sectarianism and, uh, 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 and so on. Now, I think here uh, uh, a whole number of things interact. The, uh, Alex referred to the failure of Trotsky's followers, his epigonies, his uh, etc., to be able to creatively develop uh, uh, Marxism uh, and so on. Uh, abs absolutely right. The fact that, and I mentioned this, the fact that they clung to formula when the formula clearly didn't apply. The, the comrade who said about Trotsky didn't say it was a socialist revolution in China, so it's quite quite, I was just been trying to speak very quickly and rush things together. But the view that, which Trotsky did hold, that state ownership <coughs> defines a country as a worker state, which he held in relation to Russia. Then if you apply that particular formula, as opposed to the spirit of Trotsky, which was all about working class struggle and so on, if you and the self-emancipation of the working class, if you applied that particular formula, you ended up with the view that you know, North Korea is a worker state state ownership and so on, you, you, you end up in the position that has caused so much damage to, 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 to the Trotsky movement. But the fact that the people who followed Trotsky were unable to develop uh, Marxist theory of face reality, same on the question of the post-war boom that they couldn't recognise and so on, was also a product of the fact that they were very isolated from the, the, from the class. And I, I, I want to repeat the fact here that I think that we have the objective and the subjective interact and unfortunately have reinforced each other. So isolation from the class becomes uh, 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 then a sectarian attitude that reinforces that uh, isolation. Marx, there's a great quote from Marx which says, uh, 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 for the uh, the difference between a revolution and a sectarian. For a sectarian, their point of honour is what differentiates them from the class. For the revolutionary, their point of honour is what unites them with, uh, with, 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 with the class. And I think that, that this is applied uh, very much to, to, to the Trotskyist movement. Now the question that we face, therefore, is what <coughs> do we do about it? Now, um, 
what's the way, the, the way forward in, in the situation? Right, yes. Um, I don't, uh, uh, I, I haven't got time, I'm getting the sum up uh, again, I haven't got time to respond to the detailed thing about Trotsky's mistake and the wasn't the, I just want to say on this that I don't think you find, I don't think the answer is to find the original sin. I don't think it's to find, oh well we trace it back to Trotsky's error in, you know, I don't think that's the, the right uh, Marxist method. Whether the Fourth International was founded on the right or wrong basis, etc. is a problem, but it's not the fundamental problem. The problem is what's the way out of uh, the, this difficulty for, for, for the movement. Now here, uh, I want to, 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 to make two points. One, I think that we are in favour of the United Front, and in that sense we are in favour of left unity uh, in, in the struggle. But I don't think, I have to say, that the way forward in this lies primarily, maybe necessary at certain points in time, but primarily through regroupment of the left. That is, you do not create a, uh, you will not create a, a, a mass movement or, uh, or build a revolutionary party by adding together lots of different sects. I just don't think that's going to, going, going to work. Um, you have in, here in, uh, uh, in Britain an organisation that calls itself left unity but then actually becomes another part of the disunity of the left and so on. It, 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 it has to become, in my opinion, uh, through interaction with the working class. Now that's easier said than done, of course. But that is that is the that is the, the, the task, and I, I didn't I don't really agree about the the, the weakness of the working class movement uh, today. Now this is a whole different topic and it's a question of where you put the emphasis and so on. But I just would emphasise that on a world scale, the working class movement is stronger and has more potential than it ever did, enormously so, and that we also see the potential. Pool strongly in the president for, 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 for mass workers' movements and so on. Uh, for example, with all its political problems, you've had a mass movement here, here, here in Spain that is finding some form of political reflection in Podemos and so on. And we have to find ways of relating to these while at the same time building a revolutionary party. Now, the nature of this meeting means that these things can't be investigated. It's not possible to get all the emphases right and so on. Uh, but I just I want to argue uh, in this that uh, Trotskyism today, whatever we call it, and other people will call us Trots whether we like it or not, Trotskyism today means for, for me, uh, above all, maintaining that fundamental legacy of Trotskyism, which is also the fundamental legacy of classical Marxism, of revolutionary Marxism today, including the building of an independent revolutionary party and the finding ways to do that in the real living workers' movement as it develops. That's what I think is the way forward.